Ninja Kamui, an original anime which aired on February 10th, 2024, captivates with the tale of Higan, a former ninja from a secretive clan who escapes to rural America to live peacefully under the name Joe Logan. Tragedy strikes when his past catches up, leading to the brutal murder of his wife and son propelling him back into the life of a ninja to seek vengeance. The series blends action, sci-fi, and a touch of fantasy to explore themes of revenge, identity, and redemption. This rich narrative foundation promises an engaging journey through its visually striking world. But this isn't gonna just be your normal old recap video of Ninja Kamui. I wanna discuss how we went from this to this. Because I'll be honest, Ninja Kamui is not doing so hot right now. There was a point when I was very excited to watch every new episode that came out. But eventually, with time, like, my excitement and enthusiasm dwindled and dwindled. So let's break down some of these characters as well as the plot and get into what makes this show a lot less exciting than what it used to be. And for those of you wondering, I did my researching and scouring of the internet as I love to do, and I don't believe that Ninja Kamui has a specific manga curated to it. Some have said that it's drawn inspiration from John Wick, yes. as well as a specific anime manga called Ninja Kamui, but it's not the same storyline, so it's completely original, it's completely original anime, and I want to say before I go on that this is the reason why it's not as good as it could be because it doesn't have enough source material to pull from. So, you know, what happens when there is no source material? The writers start improvising, and they just start going off script because there is no script. And that always usually tends to make for a bad anime. So, think Full Metal Alchemist, the first version, before Brotherhood. And then we know why. When you don't have a manga to follow, you just, you know, you just have no direction. Here's an excerpt I read from We Got This Covered. Currently, Ninja Kamui does not have a manga. This is an original anime, meaning that it's not based on any other piece of media. Granted, it's not uncommon for original series to later sprout manga adaptations, but that isn't the case with Ninja Kamui at the time of writing. Thus, the only way to keep following Joel Higan's story is by watching the anime as it airs or on streaming. Let's break down some of the characters that I believe are most important and pivotal to this story. And while you're at it, make sure you like and subscribe because it greatly helps the channel and we're trying to push this to 10,000 subscribers, so share with a friend as well. Without further ado, let's continue. So first character we have is Higan or Joe Logan. Once a revered ninja, Higan breaks his clan's cardinal rules by forming attachments and prioritizing love over duty. His transition back to a ninja after his family's murder highlights his complexity and duality of his existence, oscillating between peace and vengeance. Character two, we have Mari or Sarah Logan. Higan's wife, whose death ignites the flame of revenge in the series. Her character serves as an emotional cornerstone for Higan's actions, symbolizing love and loss in the brutal world of ninjas. I'm not gonna lie, this sounds something straight out of Hell's Paradise, but who knows? With no manga, who knows where they're getting their source material from? They could have been pulling it out of their hat, to be honest. So I'm sure it's just a bunch of loosely written stories all jumbled together to try and make something good and make some money on HBO Max. Why is it on HBO Max, of all things, too? That was another one that kind of had me a little bit confused, but whatever. Number three, Yamaji. The malevolent clan master and the series primary antagonist, responsible for Logan's family's assassination, Yamaji's manipulations and power plays within the ninja world reveal the dark underbelly of clan politics and the extensive reach of his influence. Characters number four and five are Mike Morris and Emma Samanda, FBI agents who become entangled in Higan's quest. Their involvement introduces a procedural element to the series, bridging the gap between ordinary law enforcement and the clandestine ninja world, while also unpacking the conspiracy involving the Alza Corporation. But we can't glaze over Emma because, and spoiler alert, she actually is part of the ninja organization and she also aids Higan in his quest for revenge. I'm not going to say how, but we know that she's part of the ninja organization. I don't want to give her backstory because I want you guys to watch her for yourself. But yeah, she's part of the ninja organization and so she's an important character to to look out for and she also has a lot of more important things about her than she's than we're first told. 
Last but not least, we have the Alza Corporation, a shadowy multinational corporation that's intricately linked with the Ninja Clan, representing corporate malfeasance and its capacity to wield power across global and local spectrums. Initially, Ninja Kamui was lauded for its exhilarating combat sequences and tight narrative pacing. Early episodes were particularly praised for their choreography and the seamless integration of traditional and modern combat styles, setting high expectations for character development and plot advancement. This initial reception painted Ninja Kamui as a potential modern day classic in the making. I'm not, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I promise it, was, it, it showed so much promise. I would say episodes one through four were heat, fight scenes crazy, and also we knew that the older ancient ninjas had a hidden technique, if you will, almost like a Keke Genkai that only they can use and they couldn't reveal that technique to anyone and it was very powerful. Hegon had one, but they never really truly explained what it was, I think we were getting to that point, and basically all of Alza and all the other ninjas were even afraid of Hegon in combat because of that secret technique and they didn't know it because it was secret only to him. Even when he learned it at his clan, it was still a secret. Everyone gets their own. And I'm sure only the older ninjas have them now, meaning that would leave only Higan Mari, who passed as his wife, and the third ninja, whose name I believe is Zai. However, the narrative and fan reception took a downturn with the introduction of the Kamui battles. Mech suit fights that felt jarringly out of step with the series established tone. These battles criticized for their departure from the series' core ninja themes seem to prioritize spectacle over substance, diluting the personal and gritty revenge story that had initially drawn viewers. The shift not only alienated fans, but also muddled the, the series' thematic focus, turning epic personal vendettas into impersonal mech skirmishes. And I have to add this comment, I truly wasn't sure if they were going to like run with the mech suits, maybe I thought just one ninja used them. I thought the little short guy, cause he couldn't really fight. That was his way of compensating in battle with ninjas. And cause even at times, Zai and Hegon had a standoff where I don't think they were gonna use mech suits, but now all of a sudden it's just like mech suits only. I'll be honest, I don't know who gave them this idea, but they threw away a really good show with that idea. I don't think it would have been too hard to make them fight individually. Maybe the animations might be easier, but I doubt they are because, as we know with mech suits, that takes a lot of CGI. And it's funny, I don't know what makes it distasteful to me because, I mean, there's CGI with Attack on Titan and the Titan battles, and even those were interesting enough to, to carry on and watch. And I'm hoping that, hint, hint, another anime I'm going to be posting about very soon, Kaiju number 8, I'm hoping that the huge... Um, just battles that are not humanoid will not de de uh, alienate watchers and viewers from the battle because we like to view things that are like easy to understand. So I'd rather much watch a one-on-one -on -one Sasuke versus Naruto than a one-on-one -on -one Ninetales versus um, Suzuno. I allude to this all the time. I call it the Power Rangers effect. Once the characters get into their Zoids, we kind of don't want to watch it anymore. We like the humanoid battle. It's more relatable. I don't know. That's like a human nature kind of thing. But it just is what it is. In reflection, Ninja Kamui presents a classic case of a series with a strong start but unable to maintain its narrative and thematic integrity. It showcases the challenges of balancing fan expectations with creative direction. While it started as a poignant, tale of revenge and identity, the later episodes highlight the risk of genres blending when not consistently executed. Despite its potential, Ninja Kamui serves as a lesson in maintaining a cohesive narrative vision, especially when the core appeal is rooted in character-driven storytelling. But enough about what I think guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. This analysis of Ninja Kamui uncovers the highs and lows of anime storytelling, from its compelling start to the controversial shifts that challenge its reception. For more deep dives into anime hits and misses, keep watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment on your views about Ninja Kamui's journey from a promising start to a debated decline. And before you go, remember to, as always, find your zen, your final form. I'll see you in the next one, guys. <laughs>